Well, good morning. Welcome to worship. How is everybody today? Cold. cold. Yeah. Hey, we're glad you, you braved the cold. A little snow on my back deck this morning. It was just a cool little thing to look at. So it's probably melted by the time I get home. But um, we're glad you're here today. My name is Scott Jones. I want to welcome those that are, that are watching us online and thank you for viewing online. We appreciate you checking us out virtually today. I want to thank you for being here today on such a cold morning. I um, have a few announcements to make. Uh, church office will be closed tomorrow uh, because of Martin Luther King holiday. And next Sunday, there will be a diaper shower for Harry and Sam from 2 to 3 in the hospitality room. Mark your calendars on January 30th. We'll have a joint combined service in the sanctuary. Uh, that's, um, um, we'll, we'll, give, we'll have our, our yearly infant Bible presentation joked around in Sunday school. I'm probably the oldest one up there with an infant that day, getting a Bible that day. So, um, But if you know somebody that's had a baby this past year in the life of the church, whether they uh, are a member or a regular attender, um, let Edith know. She has a good list, but we want to be sure to include um, everyone in that. Also that Sunday, we'll have a State of the Church Sunday. Uh, we'll be talking about the life of the church, the ministry that, that um, God has allowed us to do in the past and where we think God has taken us in the future. And the last announcement, you've probably heard this. We want to thank everybody that gave blood this past week uh, for John Joyner's mom. We had 24 units given here, and we had several platelets and other units of blood given at, at the blood services on 28th Avenue. I want to thank you for that, but um, if you haven't heard, his mom passed away this past Friday afternoon at about 5 o'clock. And um, just um, when we come together and pray here in a few moments, we're going to um, say a special prayer for, for the family um, this morning. The funeral is tomorrow at 2 o'clock at Crestview Memorial Gardens in Brandon. This is at 2 o'clock. It's a graveside service only. Public's invited to graveside. There's going to be a, a visitation at the funeral home, but that's just closed just to family members only uh, for a short time before that 2 o'clock graveside service. Pray for John. I talked to him yesterday. He is, he is doing the funeral service uh, tomorrow. So just um, pray that God would give him extra grace, extra strength, and comfort, and that God would give him the words that will bring comfort um, to his family um, during this time. Lots to pray for, a lot of sickness going around, um, you know, just, um, we just got a lot, a lot of praying that needs to be done this time of year in the life of the church. So uh, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, we just want to lift up John to you. God, we thank you so much for him. God, I really do think he's the best youth minister in the state, and I thank you that, that, that you have allowed him to, to come our way. And God, we just want to pray for his family today. And pray for him as he prepares for the funeral tomorrow, Father. God, may, um, may you give him the right words to say tomorrow. But we pray for mercy and grace for his family, Father. God, as we sing today, as we worship today, as we hear the word preached today, Father, may we all grow closer to you as a result of our worship today, Father. God, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that the tomb is empty and that Jesus is alive and that you're still at work in our world today, Father. God, help us to always remember that you're with us every step of the way as we live our lives, as we go to work, as we play, Father, as we go to school, you are with us. God, help us to find strength and comfort in that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're getting ready to sing, or not sing. You know, we're going to sing the Apostles' Creed. The words are going to be on the screen, and I'm going to get my cheat sheet over here. I w Do I have time to share a little funny with you um, with the Apostles' Creed? I, I like to do a little teaching moment with the Apostles' Creed, but... You know, back in the pandemic when we were doing um, all online services, we were filming everything in here, and Reagan pulled one on me one night. Uh, we were doing the, the, the Wednesday night um, communion service online. So we're taping it, and I get in here and I'm taping it. And, you know, with me, not with all the other staff members, we had to do several retakes with me <laughs> just because of, of my 
ADD issues with everything. But um, we're getting ready, done the communion service, we're getting ready to recite the Apostles' Creed. No, it was the Lord's Prayer. We was getting ready to pray the Lord's Prayer. And um, I started praying the Lord's Prayer, and I just drew a blank. And I said, Reagan, we, we got to do this over again. I got to get my cheat sheet. Uh, and I walk over here and get my cheat sheet, walk back, and I look at Reagan. I said, no, you're going to edit that out, right? And he said, yeah. Well, guess what he didn't do? He didn't edit it out. Here I am. I, y'all know, I think I even said, y'all know I don't know the, the Lord's Prayer. I got to get my cheat sheet. We have cheat sheets up here. At Lord's Prayer is on. Well, that's a great commitment for the great kingdom. This is the Apostles' Creed. But I um, don't know why I just told y'all that, you know. <laughs> You know, I, I pre- pretend to be no one else but myself. <laughs> and um, we're getting ready to recite the Apostles' Creed. And we can take great encouragement and we can find strength in this creed that Christians have recited for centuries. It's the essentials of our faith and it's an awesome reminder of what we believe as the body of Christ. So if you would, the words will be on the screen. Recite the Apostles' Creed with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You go ahead and invite y'all to stand with us this morning. And as we continue in worship, we're just going to take a moment um, just to continue in that spirit of prayer and reflection and just uh, take time to awaken ourselves to the presence of God here with us this morning. Um, so whether that is for you to, to continue just to pray for a second, if that's to sit still and listen, if you need to sit back down, if you need to stretch your hands out, whichever you need to do um, in this moment, just to, to help push out some of those distractions that maybe you walked in the door with as we get ready to move into this next week and um, just continue dealing with the craziness of life, Um, whatever that is that you need to do to center yourselves in this moment, I want to just encourage you to do that. So I'm just going to play softly for a few seconds and and give you the opportunity to do that, and then we're going to worship together.
phone so y'all forgive me. All right, our scripture reading this morning comes from John 14, 1 through 7 and 26 through 28, and this is the New Living Translation. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so you always be with me where I am, and you know the way to where I'm going. No, we don't, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. When the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace, the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I have told you. I am going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really loved me, you would be happy that I am going to the Father, who is greater than I am. This is the word of God for the people of God. Good morning. Thank y'all again for being here. Thank y'all. Y'all give them a hand for leading us in worship this morning. Appreciate y'all leading us this morning. If you got your Bibles, turn to um, John 14. We're going to be in there for a little bit today. And uh, we started a new sermon series last week talking about fresh air, how the gospel renews and revives and we need to be reminded of some of the principles and some of the things that Jesus taught. And that's what we're going to look at today. I don't know if we'll get through with this sermon today. This may be a two-parter because John chapter 14 is probably my favorite chapter in the whole Bible. There's a lot of good stuff. In fact, we're going to look at a lot of the verses in, in there today. And uh, so just hang with me there uh, and keep your finger on John 14 or find it on your phone. We're going to um, look at that in some detail in a moment. One of my favorite movies that came out several years ago, and, um, and I'm just going to go ahead and admit it, was Miss Congeniality. Uh, any, anybody else like that movie? Okay. Okay. Um, ten of y'all were honest. And um, so, um, so in the movie, there's an FBI agent named Gracie Hart. And she's being sent to infiltrate this beauty pageant to keep a bomb from going off. And it's a funny scene in the movie. Uh, they're asking all the beauty contestants, uh, what is the one thing that our society needs? And every one of them says what? World peace. A lot of y'all saw that movie. <laughs> World peace. 
You know, that scene is meant to be as a, as a joke, and, but there's, a, there's a, a, a note of truth that rings through this idealistic dream. You know, we're starting a new year this year when one year slips into another year. We all wish for peace on earth, and it's on a lot of our minds. But more than world peace, a lot of us want peace in our own lives. When we think of peace, we think of a lack of conflict. But in the gospel, we're going to study, we're going to see and study today that it means something much more fulfilling than lack of conflict. Verses 1 through 7 in chapter 14 are probably some of my favorite Bible verses in, in all of Scripture. And you frequently hear this passage read at funerals because of the promises of what God says. He goes and prepares a place where I am the way. Uh, you will know where I am going. Such great strength and encouragement in times when we've lost a loved one. But the challenge here today is to tell you that is not only for when loved ones die or that the passage that preachers preach when they're doing a, a, a funeral. That passage has a lot to do with us today who are alive and who are living you see it contains some of the greatest promises in scripture let's look at the setting you know we talked about context in scripture let's look at the setting of john 14 is the last supper that's the setting and if you go if you got your bibles look in john 13 real quick the setting is jesus farewell address to his disciples and if you look at the first part of John 13, Jesus washes the disciples' feet, humbles himself, and he explains to them all what that means. He um, has foretold the betrayal of Judas, and we see that Judas sort of slips out the back door. He has told his disciples that I'm going to be with you for a little bit longer in verse 33. And that where he is going, they cannot come at this time. And at the close of chapter 13, he shares and foretold Peter's denial to him. Then we get to 14.1. No wonder the disciples were troubled. Their desire for peace is something that God, the desire of peace is something that God has planted in all our hearts. And right here, the ground is crumbling under the disciples' feet with this news that Jesus has shared him. The key to finding peace and security in this life is perfectly summed up in Jesus' words in 14.1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. These words were meant to calm minds of his disciples who learned all this bad news that Jesus is going to be betrayed, that he's going to die, he's going away. One of their own is, 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 is abandoning them and betraying them. And probably the leader of the pack, Peter, is going to deny him by the next morning. They're troubled. They need peace. As we study the gospel, uh, we discovered that the, the, that very peace is what God longs for us to experience that peace that God wants to give us. The Hebrew word, and the word all translated for, for, for the word peace in Scripture, um, means complete, safe, perfect, whole, full. And at peace. You see, God longs for us to be complete in him. He longs for us to be safe in him. He longs for us to be perfected in him. And he longs for us to be at peace with him. That is why Jesus came to this earth and walked among us. So that we can find refuge. A refuge of hope. A refuge of mercy. A refuge of love. A refuge of peace even in a world that's filled with so much despair conflict and unrest that is why Jesus came to be with us you know the Jewish people back then and, and you know this from studying scripture and studying the gospels they expected the Messiah to come and conquer the Romans 
and to, to rule harshly with those that have, that have uh, persecuted the Jews and the Christians of, of, of that day. We look at Jesus, the type of peace he brought. You know, Jesus could have waged war against nations that were opposed to the Christians, but he did not do that. Jesus brought peace to the individuals, to those that are sick, to those that are outcast, to those that are, 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 are lonely. If you look in the book of Luke, uh, he, he brought peace to the lepers. You know that story, the 10 lepers that he healed. He brought peace to the man that was tormented by demons. He brought peace to the woman that had a problem with hemorrhaging. And he even brought peace to the prominent and respected Jairus and her daughter. The gospel also shows us that God would rather we find rest in him than have to jump through a bunch of hoops to prove our love and devotion. Jesus brought peace to his disciples. Imagine hearing all that and all of a sudden Jesus says, guys, let not your hearts be troubled. Why did he have to say that? They were troubled. They didn't know peace at that time time Jesus brought peace to his disciples and followers showing them that they didn't need to do all these things to be found in favor with God in fact if you look in Luke chapter 10 when Mary sat at Jesus' feet Martha got upset she was busy about doing cleaning the house doing things for Jesus and, Mar and, and, and Luke told I mean Jesus told Martha in Luke chapter 10 Martha Martha why are you anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Is being with the one that can bring peace. Max Lucado um, is one of my favorite authors. And he said this about the peace that Jesus brings. Jesus' heart was peaceful. The disciples fretted over the need to feed thousands. But not Jesus. He thanked God for the problem. The disciples shouted for fear in the storm, but Jesus did not. He slipped through it. Catch this. This is the main point of, of the sermon today. Jesus' example reveals to us that we're not expected to solve all our problems and troubles we face. Rather, we can find peace in them by bringing them to the Father and thanking him for the opportunity to grow and trust him and to have faith in him. In that last section that, that Natalie read for us, the gospel shows us true peace is found in the fulfilled promise of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit sent to each and every believer. Listen to 26 and 27 again. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I've told you. I am leaving you with a gift peace of mind and heart and the peace I give you is a gift that the world cannot give so don't be troubled or afraid there's that phrase again it's in that same context of the last supper Jesus is telling us not to be troubled or afraid the purpose of God's spirits in our lives is for Jesus to correct us I mean excuse me for the Holy Spirit to correct us and teach us, to edify us. We find that from Romans, to edify us rather than condemn us and to fill us so that we may abound in hope in this life and experience that peace that only God can bring us. As believers, we don't have to wonder if God's angry with us when things go wrong in our lives. But because of Christ, atoning blood, we are no longer objects of God's wrath. Instead of when trouble arises, we can be encouraged knowing that we can turn to God and ask for wisdom and to see if our struggle is a spiritual attack or a time of correction or some type of opportunity for growth. Y'all know, I told y'all a few weeks ago, if you got your Bibles, turn to chapter 14. I told y'all a few weeks ago that I... Some, some people have a word for the year as they start a new year, and, and many of y'all have shared that with me. Uh, I have a phrase this year, God with us. 
if we really knew that God was with us, wouldn't that change the way we live? Wouldn't that change our attitudes, our motives, the way we relate to people outside these four walls, which God calls us to do? Absolutely. So that's what I'm reminded. I have a little, I have to write it down in the office. If you call, call the office and tell me, want me to do something, say, Scott, are you writing this down? Because I will probably not remember it. You know, I get probably 100 emails a day. Most of them are pretty good emails. Um, but, um, and I try to respond to every email that I get. Uh, but I have a little three by five card that breaks my week up. And I write everything on that. And I have a notebook. Somebody got me a notebook for Christmas that says, this is the stuff that I'll probably forget that I need to write down on, on a part of a journal that I have. So you'll see that with me in the office and at staff meetings and stuff like that. But this phrase, God with us, we need to be constantly reminded that he is with us. And I get that from the passage, uh, when we, I guess when we're doing our Christmas um, sermons, uh, that his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And we need to be reminded of that. We need to be reminded of that all the time. But especially individually, we need to be reminded of that. But corporately as a church, we need to be reminded of that. That God is with us. God's going ahead of us. God is going ahead of us. God's making a way for whatever God wants us to do. He is with us. And that's why I think chapter 14 is one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture because it's a huge reminder that God is with us. Look at this for me. I think I've gone through this with you before. Maybe it was a couple of years ago. But I just want to point some things out. God is telling his disciples in, in verse 1, don't let your hearts be troubled. They're troubled because of what Jesus just told them. And he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. How comforting is that? We can gather from God's word that, that Jesus is preparing a place for us. And that our loved ones that have already died and, and who, were, who, who were believers, they have inherited that place. How encouraging is that? God is with us here, but, but our loved ones that have already passed on from this life to the next, they're in the presence of God. How comforting is that? Verse 18, Jesus says this, and I love this. And he's telling, this is in the context of him talking to his disciples. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Jesus is trying to encourage his disciples. Hey, hey, I'm going away. I'm going to die, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit to, to teach you and guide you and remind the things that, that, that I have taught you. But I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I'm going to come back one day and get you. If you turn the page, go to verse 25. And I love, uh, verse 23, I'm sorry. I love this verse. Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. There's another thing about obedience there. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Some verses say, we will make our abode with you. Who is the we? The we is Jesus. The we is God, the Father. He's going to send an advocate, the Holy Spirit, Jesus is not going to leave us as orphans. The Holy Spirit is with us. He's coming back one day. But then he goes on and says, hey, we are going to come make, take up residence with you. How encouraging is that? Abide, be with you, a home. Um, they're going to come live with us. But look at verse 24. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who has sent me. I'm telling you these things that why I'm still with you. Verse 26, but when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you. I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and peace of heart. And the peace I give you the world cannot understand. Verse 28, remember what I told you. I'm going away, but I will come back again. If you love me, you would be happy that I'm going to the Father who is greater than I am. 
What encouraging words. I, I, got, I got goosebumps on my arms just thinking about the full impact and meaning of, of this passage and what we can gather from what Jesus taught his disciples, how we can apply that in our lives. Guess what that means, guys? God is with us. I want to shout glory. I mean, that should excite us that we're not living this life alone, that God is with us. And guess what? When you're going through that difficult circumstance, you can be at peace because God is with you and carrying you through. You see, peace doesn't always mean the absence of conflict. Peace means having that hope that someone is with us and will carry us through. I couldn't think of more encouraging words from Scripture that we need to talk about as we begin a, a, a new year. So I want to encourage you this morning. We can have peace because God is with us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm going to invite the praise team to come. Uh, I'm going to pray for us real quick. And I know even myself, at times in my life, I struggle with peace. And I know it's a real issue with some people. I don't mean to make light of it, but true peace can be found through Jesus Christ and the work that he did for us on the cross. Go back and study. Go back and read chapter 14, read chapter 13. What a great Savior we have that loves us unconditionally and is there with us all the time let's pray oh God I thank you so much for for this section of scripture that you have given us God help us to to look at it and to um, marinate on it learn from it help us to realize that, that you are with us and that peace is attainable God, help us to yield our life to you as we live for you, Father. God, what a breath of fresh air this is to know that the gospels renew and revive us. And God, we thank you that you are with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our ushers are getting ready to receive our offering. I want to thank you. Um, for your generosity in the past and encourage you to be generous in the future. I'm going to tell you, God is doing amazing things here at Heritage Church. I wish you could see all that I see during the week when people come in and need help and the ministry that's going on. Uh, and some of you are part of that. And i um, so grateful for that. Just here to tell you that, that, that your church is making a difference in the community. We talk about this in staff meeting from time to time. If Heritage United Methodist Church ceased to be, if this church was no longer here, would our community miss it? And we think it would because of all the good ministry that's being done, not only inside these four walls, but outside these four walls, in our community, in our state, in our nation, and with our faith missionaries that are all across the world when you give you help us to make that difference and I want to thank you for that so for ushers to come forward now receive our offering please Oh
so much. Whew, that's a good song. It's probably one of my favorites that y'all do now. Thank y'all. Remember to pray for John and his family. And um, Marty Stringer, he and his family, they, they come to this service. They're not here today. Uh, Marty's mom's having surgery at Forest General this morning. Um, so if y'all pray for uh, Marty's mom. Receive the benediction. You can be remiss, uh, dismissed. Um, God help us to remember. It's so much better your way. Go and live in peace and experience the peace that only God can provide. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>